Okay, fantastic. So, buena tarde, buenas tardes, and a very warm welcome and uh, thank you to all of you joining us tonight um, for the lecture with Dr. Simon Maven. Uh, I also would like to thank the YIMED for hosting us and organizing this event. So I'm very, very happy. I'm, I'm very excited that Simon is here with us tonight to tell us a little bit more about the Saudi-Iranian relationship, which can be uh, described as a little complicated. However, Simon is an optimist, and I believe he is going to illuminate metas for us from a positive and hopeful perspective. And to tell you a little bit more about Simon, uh, Simon is a senior lecturer at the University of Lancaster. And there he's also the director of the Richardson Institute and the SEPAT project, which is a project on sectarianism proxies and de-sectarianization funded by the Carnegie Foundation. Simon is also a prolific and very proactive writer. He has written numerous articles and reports and books and the latest of which has just come out a little while ago with Manchester University Press. And it has the beautiful title, Houses Built on Sand. Simon is also a regular commentator in the media on current events in the Middle East and the Gulf. Um, this lecture is organized by the Master um, in International Relations, Security and Development from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And some housekeeping, Simon's lecture is going to last for about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session where you can post questions in the chat boxes on Zoom or on YouTube, wherever you are joining us from. Very well. So without much further ado, Simon, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you to everyone at Daimed. And thank you all of you for, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to, to sharing some of my thoughts about the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is something that I've been working on for the best part of, of 15 years or so now, on and off. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a really important set of, of relations, rivalries, uh, an intersectional crisis, one that isn't necessarily fixed or immutable, but one that, that oscillates across time and space. And, and that's kind of what I'd like to talk a bit about today, the ways in which this, this rivalry plays out across the Middle East, but does so in a, in a way that is contingent upon a range of factors, time, space, domestic forces, regional politics, international politics, and how the rivalry is, is simultaneously shaped by, but also shapes these, these factors. And I want to focus towards the end on, on the impact of, of domestic politics in both uh, the kingdom and the Islamic Republic, but also to reflect a little bit on, on COVID-19 and the ways in which the coronavirus has, has shaped the rivalry or reshaped regional politics, according to, um, to, to my understanding of, of the, the way in which the rivalry is, is structured. But before we do that, and before I get to that point, I'm gonna try and share a screen where I hopefully have a PowerPoint presentation available. Um, moment of truth, um, play from start. That should be full screen, is that correct? Fantastic. So what I am gonna do then is try and engage with following four questions. How do we understand the rivalry between the two states? How do we understand it? How do we conceptualize it? How do we frame it? What is its impact on the Middle East? What role do domestic politics play and what is the impact of COVID-19? Now, these four questions have a number of other questions built into it. I, I sort of hinted at the first one, how do we understand the rivalry? How do we conceptualize it as well? Now, a great many people working on this topic would say that, look, the, the rivalry between these two states can be reduced to, to maybe three different positions. One suggests that it's all about power politics. It's a struggle for regional supremacy, for, for power, for influence across the, the Gulf and across the Middle East. This, this may be understood in terms of hard power or soft power, but it, it's, it's about power. That's one approach. 
The second approach suggests that it's not really about power, but it's about religion and it's about religious legitimacy, religious influence. It's the two major uh, Muslim powers in the world today, the Wahhabi Saudi Kingdom and the Shia Islamic Republic, broadly speaking and slightly simplistic, but, but that's the argument being portrayed. And that drawing on, on some of the literature from sectarianism, this rivalry pits a, a, a Sunni state against the Shia state. And because of the longstanding and fraught relations between Sunni and Shia, there is no way that these two states could be, um, could be engaging in a, in a positive form of rivalry. So that's the second position. The third position suggests that, well, it's actually a bit of both. It is about regional power and influence, of course, because they are states and states seek to maximize their, their interests according to, to the realist position, but also they are shaped by, um, by claims to legitimacy, by the ability to speak, to mold and engage with different identities, ideologies, and so that's the, the view that I subscribe to, that what we're seeing actually when we're looking at the rivalry between these two states is a, a complex interaction of power politics, but also identity politics. And that combines not only sect-based divisions, but ethnicity, culture, uh, and in many ways, ideology as well. So. That's the, the view that I would hold on this. And I'm not going to spend much time across the, the lecture talking about the three different positions, but I'd like you to just keep in mind that, that those are the three main in which the rivalry is typically understood. One, it's all about power politics. Two, it's all about religion. Three, it's actually a bit of both because religion offers a means of speaking to a range of different groups and religion offers a means of... Um, of deriving support from a range of different communities. So that's the first question. Second, what, it's, is it, what is its impact? And that begs the question, its impact where? Its impact when and how? So are we talking about in the Gulf, in the Persian Gulf? Are we talking about in the Middle East? Are we talking about across the world? Are we talking about the Muslim world? If we can speak about such a thing, are we talking about within Islam generally? We're talking about in terms of energy security? Are we talking about oil politics? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about regional security? What is the impact? Where is the impact? There's lots of different ways of engaging this type of, of question. And what I'll try and do is, is show a number of the different ways in which you can engage with these types of questions. Now, we can also bring in a, a geographical dimension to this, of course, by saying, are we focusing on specific states? And I would say that across the, the 40 years or so since the Islamic revolution, you can see that a number of arenas have emerged whereby there is a, a sense of rivalry between Riyadh and Tehran. And those, I think, would typically be acknowledged to be Bahrain, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Yemen. Now, more recently, there are other sites of competition, and we start to see this when we look at, say, Pakistan, India, Indonesia, and beyond. But I would say that, that the five states that I just mentioned, uh, Bahrain, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon, are the, the main arenas. And of course, there is a different impact on each of those arenas as a consequence of a range of different factors, including um, the foreign policy goals, foreign policy agendas, including the ways in which the, two, the states have or, or seek to cultivate relations with these different arenas. And then segueing into the third question, what role do domestic politics play? Well, I think there's, there's two dimensions to this. Are we talking about domestic politics in either Saudi Arabia or Iran? in which case we have a form of neoclassical realism that suggests that foreign policy is constructed on the basis not only of, of broader power maximization agendas, but also as a consequence of domestic politics. And so that's one dimension. But a second dimension is that the domestic politics of say these five arenas of Bahrain, uh, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen, and Syria, 
also conditions the ways in which the rivalry can play out. So for example, the political organization of the Lebanese state and the emergence of these two school, uh, these two camps, the March 8th and March 14 camp, means that the, the rivalry and the, the Saudis and the Iranians are, are kind of given the, the conditions through which they can engage in a way that, that reinforces the rivalry in that there is an existing form of, of division and competition taking place in the Lebanese state. And of course, it's different elsewhere in these different arenas. And lastly, what is the impact of COVID-19? And I think this is, this is a difficult one, but it's a pertinent one. And we can ask here, what is the impact of it in terms of uh, the impact on Saudi Arabia, the impact on Iran, the impact on the Middle East, the impact on energy politics, the impact on regional security, or the impact on the rivalry broadly? And I will focus uh, on, on the last one of those, because I think that there's a really interesting set of reflections to be made that, ref that examine the ways in which a particular period of crisis allows for a reimagining of regional politics and a reimagining of the ways in which politics plays out. So let's start briefly um, with a trip down memory lane to the time before the uh, the Islamic Revolution. Here we have a photo of um, of the Shah and Ibn Saud, the founder of the, the third and current Saudi state, sitting together. And I I think this photo is is wonderful because it it brings together these two supposed long-standing rivals and and shows them engaging in a in a dialogue and this this picture i think says a lot about the type of relationships that were playing out between the states at this point so prior to the revolution you, you saw um the two states were were on relatively favorable terms with one another the united states was trying to forge an alliance between the two states and also iraq to try and um, counter the threat posed by pan-arabism and, and communism and, and so that tells you a great deal about the, the type of relationship that was going on. And it also tells us a great deal about, um, or it, it helps us respond to the claim that it's all about religion, because prior to the Islamic Republic, Iran was still ostensibly a Shia state, albeit with religion playing a more private role in, in political life. So if that was the case, then there was no way that, that the Saudis and the Iranians could work together, given the, the openly hostile nature of Wahhabism towards Shiism and the, the concerns that many in, in Iran had about Saudi's stance towards, Shia, uh, towards the Shia. And yet here we have uh, the Shah and here we have Ibn Saud sitting together, talking together and, and seemingly working together on security. It should be stressed that there were concerns that whilst whilst Iran was happy to work with with the the nascent Saudi state, there were concerns amongst the clerics in Iran. Now, granted, the clerics played a different type of role to what they do now about the ways in which the Wahhabi ulema was was behaving towards Shia shrines, uh, and and we know that that Saudi Arabia has a complex and often. Um, fraught relationship with, with Shia groups. So that's a, an interesting and important uh, thing to note, I think. And this is something that Banafshi Kenush touches on in, in some detail in her book, um, exploring the relationship between the two states prior to the revolution, which is a fascinating time. And it sheds a lot of light on the ways in which uh, regional politics can play out albeit in a, in a changed and, and different form of, of regional organization. But of course, it changed everything. We saw that uh, there was a revolution in Iran that toppled the Shah. Uh, we saw the, the celebrations, the mass protests on the streets of, of Tehran and elsewhere, calling for the return of Ayatollah Khomeini from, uh, from exile in Paris. And, and that had a dramatic impact on regional politics. It, as uh, Sharam Chubin and Charles Tripp acknowledge, it left regional relations in tatters. It, it involved tearing up the ways in which regional politics had been playing out. 
more appropriately than the, the relationship between the Saudis, the Iranians and the Americans. Khomeini sought to change everything. He sought to establish uh, the Islamic Republic that placed Shia values and Shia values in the guise of Islamic values right at the heart of the state. Now, I say Shia values in the guise of Islamic values because I think it's important to note that that Khomeini sought to make sure that Iran was perceived as an Islamic republic rather than a Shia republic because of the demographics of the Muslim world, that Shia groups and Shia, popu uh, Shia Muslims are in a minority, a, a large minority, and there was an effort to try and ensure that, that the Islamic Republic was able to draw support from, from other, other Muslims, Sunni Muslims, beyond Shia Muslims. Yet, what was interesting is that if you look at the Iranian constitution, you'll see that it is replete with uh, reference to, to Karbala, reference to other Shia experiences, uh, Shia memories, Shia beliefs, which, which makes it a really interesting document and it makes for an Islamic Republic that is essentially Shia in character. And that of course was not well received by the Saudis. They, um, they saw this as a, as a cause for great concern. The, the Saudis had long positioned themselves as the leaders of the Islamic world. They derived their legitimacy from being the protectors of the two holy places. And the revolution in Iran really tore up and, and really challenged the ways in which the Saudis laid claim to Islamic legitimacy. So there were concerns there amongst many in Riyadh. And at the same time, there were also concerns about what was happening domestically in the kingdom. And on the left of the screen, there's a photograph that was taken of, I believe, a, a French mercenary uh, who was operating under the Grand Mosque of Mecca. This was after the Grand Mosque was seized by uh, a, a descendant of the Akwan, the uh, Wahhabi elite fighting force of the 1920s, who uh, Jahayman al Yutaybi, who had seized the Grand Mosque in 1979 in an attempt to uh, express anger, frustration um, at the, the Al Saud family, who were seen to be corrupt and pious and unworthy to be the, uh, the rulers of the two holy places. So here you have this really interesting and, and potentially serious challenge to the Saudi, uh, to the Saudi state from, from the outside, but also from within, whereby you have similar types of rhetorical claims being made by domestic critics and also regional rivals. The, the seizure of the Grand Mosque was ultimately ended by, um, by external mercenaries, including French mercenaries, who were granted permission to go into the Grand Mosque and, um, and put an end to the, the protests, uh, killing Juhayman al Utaybi and, and his followers. Now, uh, there, there are other dimensions to this protest that I don't really have time to go into. But uh, Thomas Hekama has written a fantastic book on this, and I think that's worth maybe having a look at, because the, there is a great deal going on in terms of, of the, the seizure of the Grand Mosque that really challenged the, the Saudi state, ideologically as well as politically. Now, the other incident that year was the, um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which, which created conditions for the widespread politicization of Islamic movements. So it's within this climate of, of revolution in Iran, of domestic dissent and broader politicization of Islamic movements, that the rivalry of the Saudis and the Iranians took a, a, a new turn. It, it took on additional characteristics and a lot of this was underpinned by um, a quest for legitimacy, broader efforts to, to derive legitimacy from, from Muslims across the world. And what you start to see very quickly in the formative years, uh, months and years of the uh, Islamic Republic are rhetorical attacks on the Saudi state, and in particular on the Al Saud. And there are some quite venomous attacks not only from Khomeini, but other senior officials on 
key members of the Al Saud, who in turn respond to uh, to these charges with equally damning criticisms um, levied at, at Khomeini, including parallels with the Nazis and um, suggestions that Khomeini is trying to draw parallels with, with God. So there's some really quite serious allegations flying around that, that make an already tense situation far, far worse. Now, of course, there was the Iran-Iraq war going on at this point as well, where, um, where Iraq invaded Iran as an attempt to prevent the spreading of the revolution. And Saudi Arabia had a great deal of concern about what was going on in Iraq because of the emergence of the, the new Ba'athist ruler Saddam Hussein, but ended up providing financial support to the Iraqis because of their concerns about what was happening in, uh, in Iran at this time. And so what we start to see in the years that, that follow are efforts to try and redraw regional politics. And this is both intentional and unintentional. And you see that, um, that groups across the region become inspired by what had happened in Iran, particularly Shia groups. And uh, you, you see that in, in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia, there were protests and uh, demonstrations following the revolution in Iran, not necessarily um, directly incited by Iran, as many would have you believe, but inspired by what happened. And then you also have events in Bahrain and Lebanon, which were driven by Iran as an attempt to try and spread the revolution amongst Shia, Shia communities. So in Lebanon, the Iranian state provided a great deal of financial, ideological, logistical support to um, the, the Lebanese party of God, Hezbollah, which was formed in 1982. Now, a couple of years prior to that, um, the, the Iranians provided support to the Islamic Front for the liberation of Bahrain, which was a, an indigenous movement sought to topple the, the Al Khalifa ruling family there. And this was ultimately thwarted by the, uh, the Al Khalifa and its security forces. But the legacy of that movement and the legacy of Iranian involvement in Bahrain was really important. And it would shape how the how the Al Khalifa and indeed other Sunni Arab rulers would respond to protest amongst Shia communities in the in the years that that followed. Yeah, at the end of the 1980s and with the death of Ruhollah Khomeini, we start to see a an evolving rivalry. We start to see a change in the ways in which uh, Tehran and Riyadh engaged in, in relations. And this was in part triggered by domestic changes in both states, but also a devastating earthquake that shook Iran um, in the early 1990s and left around 70,000 people dead. Now, in response to that, Saudi Arabia provided a great deal of support to Iran, and it was essentially facilitated by an opening up of the Islamic Republic as, as Ali Khamenei took charge, but struggled to really reassert, or assert, I should say, the, the power and the influence that Ruhol Khomeini, his predecessor, had exerted. So there was this, this space politically in, in domestic Iranian politics that allowed figures such as uh, Raf Sanjani to, to engage in discussions with then the Saudi Crown Prince Abdullah. And, and there was scope for a burgeoning rapprochement between the two states. And this la lasted from the early 1990s until around 2003. And the, the two states engaged in discussions about regional security. They engaged in discussions about improving bilateral relations. And it was a really positive period in, in, the, in the relationship. Yet it was ultimately thwarted by broader uh, regional and international trends. And given the way in which the two states view the United States, it was hardly surprising that following the 9-11 the attacks, the declaration of war on terror, and the positioning of Iran within an axis of evil, 
it's hardly surprising that the uh, the burgeoning rapprochement between the two states would ultimately come to uh, come to an end, and and this of course was exacerbated by everything that happened in in Iraq following the U.S. led invasion in two thousand and three. Now here we have the opening up of a state, the hollowing out of the the Baathist infrastructure, which I should note. Um, erstwhile British uh, Foreign Ministry, Minister Philip Hammond said was one of the biggest mistakes that the British made, ultimately leading to the rise of Daesh. But the hollowing out of the state opened up Iraq for, for new opportunities. It opened up Iraq for, um, for figures, political elites to return from Iran and from elsewhere, figures that had been exiled under Saddam. And, and this allowed Iran and other states to vie for influence. Now, of course, the, the long border that Iraq shared with Iran meant that many who were fleeing Saddam fled to Iran and found a home in their um, religious kin, let's say. And, and that meant that the years that, that these individuals spent in, in Iran after fleeing from Iraq they cultivated relationships that when they went back to Iraq, they were able to, to continue, meaning that Iran was able to, um, to exert a great deal of influence in Iraq as a consequence of the, the political class, the military, the security infrastructure being hollowed out and a space emerging for, uh, for Iran to exert influence. Now, this was a, a great concern to Saudi Arabia, who who were very concerned about rising uh, Iranian influence across the region, which I think is, is, is interesting to note, given that the, the, the apparent rapprochement between the two states had only recently failed, but yet there was still a very strong concern. And I think this is perhaps a consequence of the end of a tripolar regional uh, system that, that had Iraq, Iran and Saudi Arabia operating in tandem, if you will. And now having, uh, having removed Iraq from the equation, you have a bipolar system whereby the two states, Saudi Arabia and Iran were competing and competing in Iraq. And it's in this context then with the Americans on the front line against um, Iranian trained militias, against an Al Qaeda in, uh, insurgency and against other, um, other groups, tribal alliances, etc. <laughs> excuse me, that the Saudis start putting more and more pressure on the Iranians, embarking on a process of securitization, trying to get the Americans to strike against the Islamic Republic. And it's there where you see the, uh, the infamous quote from, uh, from, I believe it was King Abdullah, asking the Americans to, and I quote, cut off the head of the snake calling for a direct military strike on the Islamic Republic. That tells you a great deal, not only about the type of relationship that Saudi Arabia has with the United States, but also about the nature of relations between the two, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, at a point so close to this, this period of rapprochement. So regional politics and the realignment of regional politics has a big impact on the ways in which the rivalry is, is playing out. So I think that that's really quite important to note. And in the years that follow, you see uh, tensions ratcheting up across, uh, across not only Iraq, but also the broader Middle East. And we see the realignment of regional politics stemming from a concern about rising Iranian influence. And this is perhaps best seen in the uh, comments from King Abdullah of Jordan, who talked about a rising Shia crescent. So I think that that's really, um, really quite important here because we start to see that uh, there is a regional collective forming, an anti-Iranian collective forming that starts to frame events along sect-based lines, positioning it as a sense of, um, of, an, of a Shia crescent doing the bidding of Tehran, doing the nefarious of Tehran, seeking to destabilize the region. Now, of course, there's an element of truth to this, particularly seen in the actions of Qasem Soleimani, who's, um, 
whose efforts to cultivate networks across the region were, were infamous and led to uh, a hugely um, fascinating piece in foreign policy by Stanley McChrystal, who uh, a US general, who speaks in deferential terms about, about Soleimani and what he was able to achieve. So it's an interesting period intellectually, albeit one that has devastating consequences for, for regional politics and for, um, for human life across the region. The other thing I should say just on that last point is that we also start to see the, the seeds of burgeoning rapprochement between the Gulf states and Israel, particularly through shared concerns about Iran and the threat posed by Iran. And that, that comes from sort of late 2007, 2008, as, as we hear Gulf leaders talking about the need to, to move towards recognition of Israel and opening up of, of lines of dialogue with the Israelis. Now, the events of 2011 would exacerbate many of these fears and would exacerbate um, security fears and competition between the Saudis and the Iranians. And this, of course, was emerging from the Arab uprisings, the ways in which the um, political projects across the region were called into question as sites of contestation, whereby um, the, the popular protests that swept across the Middle East in early 2011, late 2010 and early 2011, created opportunities for the reimagining of political life. And we saw this, of course, from, from North Africa, from the Maghreb, all the way across the Gulf. But there were particular states that were harder hit than others. Um, Bahrain, Syria, later in, in, the, in the process, Yemen. And these became sites of broader struggles between the Saudis and the Iranians, partly because of the divided societies that were naturally allowing the two states to, to get involved in a relatively straightforward manner, but also because of their geopolitical importance. And so the ways in which this plays out, the, the fact that a number of states were called into question and the rulers of these states were, were vocally condemned and contested and the societies that were, were living in these states were divided along um, sect-based lines, if you will, meant that there was an opportunity for Riyadh and Tehran to, to exert influence to try and increase their own influence at the expense of the other. And so I think we've got some interesting dynamics that start to play out here. So in, in Syria, of course, protesters uh, took to the streets calling for political reform, um, calling for reform of the Assad regime. And, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the, the Saudis who'd, who'd spent the past couple of decades trying to woo Assad away from Iran, um, they, they saw an opportunity here to, to do this. They saw an opportunity to topple Assad and to increase their own influence in, uh, in Syria at the expense of the Iranians. Now, Iran, of course, was, was working desperately to, uh, to prevent this from happening. They were very concerned about the threat to the Assad regime because Assad was, was integral to Iran getting some some degree of, of traction in the Arab world. And Iran viewed Syria not only as, as a form of legitimacy in the Arab world, but also as a, a means of getting access to, to, um, to Syria, to Lebanon and to Hezbollah in particular. And then conversely, in Bahrain, you see uh, the, the Al Khalifa ruling family, close allies of Saudi Arabia, being called into question, being uh, being challenged by initially a cross sectarian grouping, but with a large Shia majority being ruled over by a Sunni minority, there was the scope for a process of sectarianization to take place, whereby the ruling family and its Saudi backers engaged in the sectarianization of the protests as doing the bidding of of Iran. 
suggesting that the protesters were Shia puppets doing the bidding of Tehran. Now, this is where it's really important that we look at the domestic history, because as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons this was ultimately successful because of Iran's previous uh, engagement, manipulation, meddling in domestic affairs, notably the case of the um, IFLB, the Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain. So there's an interesting dimension here that was um, was was called into question as as the protesters called for reform and called for an end to the Al Khalifa regime. And this, this prompted a spate of clashes. It prompted the, the Saudis to lead a, a peninsula shield force into Bahrain to prevent the, um, the protesters from, from toppling the regime. So we start to see this playing out across the region as, um, as political projects are being contested there were opportunities for Saudi and for Iran to try and exert influence at the expense of the other, capitalizing on local political contexts, trying to cultivate existing or, or create new relationships with local actors on the ground, capitalizing on, on shared religious, ethnic, cultural links. So there's a whole host of ways that this plays out, but it's contingent on the fragmentation of, um, of political projects. Now, in many ways, we start to see the cultivation of sectarian networks at this point, because as, as Stacey Strobel has argued and, and others, there's a stickiness to sectarianism that it, it resonates and it very quickly resonates and allows groups and individuals to, to find some sense of, um, of affinity very, very quickly and very easily. And it allows groups and individuals to, to cultivate relationships. And across state borders, the cultivation of sectarian networks proved very easy and very popular. And so we start to see, as these political projects are called into question, the cultivation of sectarian networks. And this is perhaps a set of discussions for another time and another place. But I just wanted to put this here because what we see, particularly post 2003 and then again post 2011, is that there's a realignment of non-state actors as well um, in this process of the contestation of political life and the fragmentation of political life. And ultimately this leads to, to spaces of contestation whereby you have particular arenas that become um, that become spaces of contestation between various actors, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between their, their local representatives. This is, of course, a photo from, from Lebanon, where you have uh, a Hezbollah flag being carried by a young boy, overlooked by uh, Hassan Nasrallah on the right and Rukhullah Khomeini on the left. So, while this is in Hezbollah uh, central, if you will, if you go to a different part of Beirut, you will get a completely different picture. You'll get a completely different view, a political, economic view, where Saudi actors exert more influence and, and Saudi-led groups, or Saudi-supported groups, exerts more influence on, on Beirut life. So, for example, um, the, the Hariris and... Uh, and, and their block exerts influence. And you have these clashes where domestic politics, domestic politics in these particular states, in these arenas, um, clash directly with also the backing of external actors. So you have space becoming increasingly contested by different actors domestically, regionally, and sometimes internationally. And this is particularly the case when you have these, these very vocal, um, very explicit conflicts and brutal conflicts like in Syria, where you have local actors um, such as, as, as the Assad regime and, and different opposition groups clashing. And then you have their backers supporting and exacerbating tensions. 
such as um, the Saudis and the Iranians, the Qataris, et cetera, et cetera. But then you also have the international dimension whereby the Americans and the Russians become involved. And you have this real mess, this spatial mess of different groups, different actors with different agendas, different aspirations, all coming together. And it leads to, to some quite serious uh, issues and, and devastation of, of political, social life and, and the fabric of everyday life. So there's a whole host of domestic factors that shape the, the capacity for the, the rivalry between these two states to play out. There's a whole host of, of issues there. And I've touched on some of them in terms of the issues that allow for the rivalry between Saudi and Iran to play out across the region. But there's also domestic factors pertaining to the kingdom and the Islamic Republic. And this relates to um, a whole host of issues from, um, from economic factors, social factors, religious, ethnic, tribal. And as I argued in my first book, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, soft power rivalry in the Middle East, the ways in which the, the Saudi and the Iranian state foreign policies are, are cultivated to try and speak to those domestic forces, those domestic issues, trying to mitigate the threat posed by some of these domestic groups. And if we take the Iranian state, for example, you have a state of around 80 million, but only 50% of whom are Persian. And that leaves a, a huge number of, of ethnic minorities operating on the periphery of the state, many of whom possess an irredentist or secessionist set of aspirations, which ultimately poses a serious challenge to the, um, the territorial and uh, integrity of the Iranian state. And so this often manifests in, in unrest, um, particularly in, in provinces such as uh, Khuzestan, where there are large Arab populations and there's a large um, oil reserves in the, uh, in the state. So balancing out some of these issues, some of these, um, some of these challenges becomes incredibly difficult for the Iranian state. In Saudi Arabia, it's slightly different, but in its eastern province, which is home to, to its majority of its oil reserves, you have huge, a lot, sorry, a long history of protest and unrest Given, a, given the ways in which the Saudi state has treated its Shia population, many of whom reside in the Eastern province. And so balancing out these domestic challenges becomes incredibly important when understanding its foreign policy and the foreign policy of Iran. Moreover, you have the economic dimensions. The Iranian state is facing serious sanctions imposed by the United States and getting around them, circumventing them, is proving incredibly difficult. That's had a huge impact on the ability of Iranians to, to live um, a, a prosperous life. Uh, and it's placed huge pressures on, on families across the state, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and, and indeed bigger businesses, placed huge pressures on the Iranian state which has meant that providing ongoing financial aid to groups like Hezbollah has proved to be incredibly unpopular amongst many of the youth in, in Iran. And for Saudi Arabia, it too has faced its own financial pressures, as particularly uh, as, as Mohammed bin Salman, the new crown prince, has sought to transform the kingdom away from a reliance on oil, uh, raising money for... Um, for its vision 2030, and in particular for NEOM, has proved incredibly difficult given some of the, the issues with regard to the Saudi legitimacy stemming from um, the Jamal Khashoggi incident and the Yemen war, but providing, uh, sorry, getting access to foreign direct investment has proved difficult. And it's also meant that the cost of living in Saudi Arabia has become incredibly, incredibly high, which has meant that it's it's becoming incredibly difficult for many uh, many young Saudis in particular to engage in this uh, in this reform project that was was incredibly popular 
that Mohammed bin Salman was incredibly popular with what he was trying to do with this, this project to, to create a more liberal Saudi society. But the cost of doing it and the cost of being able to access it is, is rising. So it's becoming increasingly difficult. And so for, for many, the, the Saudi expansionist agendas, be it in terms of military engagement or be it in terms of, for example, buying a football club in the northeast of England, has been met with criticism, particularly when the kingdom is facing its own challenges. Now, I was talking a little bit about, about coronavirus earlier on, and I'd just like to end with some remarks on the coronavirus, because I think it, it poses a number of, of interesting and important challenges when we're wanting to look at the, the rivalry between the two states. Now, there's a very clear economic dimension to what's going on in that both the Saudi state and the Iranian state have been hard hit by the coronavirus and it's, it's economic devastation that the whole world is, is suffering from. But I think in terms of the economic dimension, the Saudi state has been hit much harder. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Give, uh, sorry, um, the Iranian state has been hit much harder, given that the Saudi state has far greater access to, to financial reserves. Even with, with incredibly low oil prices, the Saudi state would be able to ride out um, this economic crisis for now. I'm not saying that it would be able to in the longer term, and I'm certainly not a, a, an economist or a political economist, but the Saudi state has access to financial resources that mean that it would be able to, to weather this type of storm. In contrast, the Iranian state is, is in a much worse position economically, which, which means that it's far less able to, to ride this out in the longer term. Now, in terms of the number of deaths, Iran has obviously been far worse uh, affected than in Saudi Arabia, um, where I believe it's only around, the kingdom has only experienced around six or 700 deaths, which obviously is a tragedy, but it's, it's far lower than the 7,000 or so that Iran experienced. Iran is now opened up again, or is in the process of opening up again, but this is obviously a complex issue that, that becomes difficult balancing as, as many states are uh, experiencing right now, balancing public and public safety against economic need. And the Iranian state is certainly in dire need of opening up and getting the economy back up and running. But it's doing so in the face of, of these very strict sanctions. So there's a, a challenge there. And, and the Saudi state, of course, is trying to do the same thing, albeit um, slight with slight a slightly better safety net than the Iranian state. Now, the thing that I think is really interesting in this regard pertains to the ways in which crises can help redraw or reimagine regional politics. And I was talking about the the case of the 1990 earthquake and the the way in which that earthquake allowed for an apparent rapprochement between the Saudis and the Iranians. And there is an argument to be made that the coronavirus could allow for a similar type of realignment to take place. And the reason for that, I think, is that responding to crises allows states to, to reimagine things. It gives them the, the context through which they can engage with rivals or with other groups in a way that is, that is beyond the parameters of what would normally be acceptable. And the example of this, of course, is the UAE and the UAE's relationship with Iran. Uh, with the, the devastation in Iran, the Emirates sent a, a great number of, of medical supplies over to Iran and it, it provided vocal support to the Iranian state. And so this was, we must remember, in the face of serious concerns amongst many Emiratis who were worried about the, the ways in which Iran was trying to increase its influence across the Arabian Peninsula. So in that case, for, uh, for the UAE to be reaching out to, to Iran and offering support shows what is possible. Now, at present, Saudi Arabia has not done this as yet, but 
there is the possibility that it could do so, particularly given that the UAE has already set set these these processes in motion. The UAE has already set in motion a, a process of of opening up to Iran and and opening up to to a dialogue. It may not necessarily lead to a lasting peace or a a regional security complex, a regional security mechanism and organization that some are hoping for, but there is a, a chance that in these conditions and the ways in which um, the ways in which a crisis allows for the reimagining of regional politics, that there is a possibility, that there is an opportunity for, um, for the two states to try and de-echolor some of the tensions that were bubbling away, particularly over the past year with the attacks on the, the Saudi oil refineries, etc. And I think that is me over time. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, I will just go and grab some water while you are taking questions, Olivia. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect, Simon. Thank Bye. you so much okay. for this uh, interesting yeah. lecture. Okay, great. So it remains for me, as Simon said, to collect a couple of questions. You can post them in, if you are on Zoom, you can um, post them in the question and answer um, box there. And on YouTube, you would likewise have the possibility to insert your questions. Please do so. Sorry. Not to worry, perfect. But um, maybe the two of us, while people are, are warming up, maybe we need a bit of an icebreaker. Um, basically, the two of us then maybe start on to break the ice. So you have been saying at the beginning that basically you're looking at, um, we're having here um, geopolitical factors. I mean, religion can be a factor, geopolitics can be a factor or a little bit of both in, in the rivalry. Um, however, then we can also, I believe we can also say that within um, geopolitical factors that then here religion plays out not in as much that um, it is a, an inherent factor where people would, um, um, would kind of, uh, um, battle with each other, but it is more because it has been instrumentalized. I was, I was looking for the right word. Um, but it is more because it has been instrumentalized in the struggle and hence it has gained much more importance because in, it has not been such an issue, whether Shia or Sunni. So in, in fact, we can actually say that religion has, has gained a much more prominent role uh, through the instrumentalization of it by, um, by state elites in the geopolitical uh, struggle. Sure, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I don't want to say that it's... I have a slight issue with the instrumentalist approach. And, and that purely is that I worry that instrumentalist approaches, particularly in discussions of sectarianism, and here I think there's an overlap, there's an interesting overlap between sectarian politics and geopolitics in the Saudi Iranian rivalry. And my one concern with instrumentalist approaches and by extension, what you're suggesting about the, the instrumentalist use of religion in the context of this rivalry by elites is that it's, it's sort of empty. That you have these identity markers that, that kind of trigger, uh, trigger belief, opinion, et cetera, et cetera but that are, are actually empty, that don't mean anything. Whereas I think religion 
particularly um, in this case, means a lot to many people. And one of the reasons why it works so much is that there's a stickiness to it. There's a resonance to it mm -hmm. that religion matters, right? Religion matters to many people in a range of different ways. And what that does is that it, it creates fertile ground for, for elites, entrepreneurs, whatever you want to term them, to, to manipulate um, to manipulate religion, to use religious identities in interesting, well, in, in a range of different ways. But the, way, the, the ways in which that works and the ways, the reasons for that working stem from the resonance that these identities have, that they are not just empty markers. So that would be my, my slight concern to an instrumentalist approach. But I think there's there's something missed in the instrumentalist approach. But yeah, I mean, there's certainly something to be said that the religion matters, that it has been used by by elites. But let's not dismiss the fact that there are many, many people in, in both states who are religious, who who are devout, who behave on the back of their religious beliefs. So I think there's a, a complexity at play here that we need to accept the, the primacy of religion, the importance of religion, that it can be used as a, as a way of understanding why people do the things that they do, but it can also be used as a means of uh, understanding why certain actors behave in the way that they do to secure power or influence or interests. No, if that makes sense. Yes, it does, thank you. Yeah, basically we can say, I mean, it does, I mean, um, work because it resonates also with people and it's because it, it tells something. Hence, this is a little bit also in connection to the stickiness that you alluded to yeah. uh, towards the, the end of the presentation, right? Because, I mean, this is why, why it also works in a certain sense. Mm. Um, we, have, we have a question here from, from Clemens Chai and he asks, how will both states emerge from the pandemic situation in terms of their global image? And he says the KSA took swift and decisive action to contain the outbreak, but there was a long delay on Iran's part. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really interesting question. My thought would be that we can't isolate this. Although I think that that's going to be something that, that will be will be interesting to explore in more detail. The extent to which individual, or the, the extent to which responses to the, the COVID-19 crisis should be viewed independently of, of state behavior writ large, I think is, for me, I think it's a difficult thing to do because the ways in which states respond are conditioned by uh, by a whole host of factors, be it declarations of, of emergencies, be it the, the political structures, be it the, the, the penetration of, of social factors, social groups by, by regimes. There's a whole host of issues that are at play here when we want to reflect on that. And I would, I would find it slightly problematic to say we can just look at that response independently i mean if we were going to yeah the, the saudis have been proactive they addressed it they um have have been affected by by it no doubt but only six or seven hundred people died compared to seven thousand and one hundred twenty thousand infections so it's no doubt the saudis addressed it well and quickly put on flights to take people home etc etc but I, I struggle to say that we can take that out of context. Things are, other factors are shaping the decisions that are taking place. For example, one of the reasons why the Iranian state wanted to keep things open was to try and address the, the serious financial pressures that it was under, right? So, so there's these other factors that are shaping the decisions that are being made and understanding the reasons for those decisions being made, I think is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting question. Thanks. 
we move on to 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 one from Michel Pitin, um, and it is in case Iran's influence in the region were to increase in countries such as Lebanon and Yemen, is there any chance of a direct war between the Islamic Republic and the KZ and Saudi Arabia? Of a direct war. Of a direct war. Okay, another interesting any question. Chance. Um, is there any chance of a direct war if Iran's influence in the region, and particularly in countries such as Lebanon and Yemen, if it were to increase? If I may start with a, a brief anecdote, I was, a couple of years ago, in fact, I was doing a talk on this topic at Harvard um, in the States, and I, I spent quite a bit of time in that presentation talking about the Saudi view of this rivalry and how it plays out across the kingdom. And at the end of it, I, I had the Q&A as you normally do. And, and in the Q&A, there were a number of people who were saying, well, what, why are you doing this? Why are you even looking at this? This doesn't matter. This isn't important. I said, OK, um, why? And the, the thought was that, well, the, the real rivalry that's at play here isn't between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's between Iran and the United States. And the Saudis don't matter. Like, OK, well, that's that's one way of looking at it. And, and so there was this dismissal of, of Saudi agency. Now, I have a big problem with that. I, I completely disagree that, that Saudi has no agency and it's just a stooge of the United States. I, I completely disagree. But the point that I'm sort of getting to here is that there is a, a sense that Saudi Arabia would not act on its own, I don't think. So a direct confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, I think is highly unlikely because I don't think the Saudis feel comfortable enough to do it on its own, to, to have any type of military engagement with Iran on their own. And you look at, at what happened in 2019 in terms of the, the attacks on the oil refineries and apparent, well, seemingly given a green light from the United States to do whatever it, it felt it needed to do, Saudi and key officials in Saudi seem to, to engage in a process of de-escalation when they appear to be given the opportunity to do what, what many would have thought they wanted to do by Washington, they did the opposite. And that says to me that either this is just a game of posturing that MBS didn't quite fancy it, or there isn't that military capacity to do what um, what many think they the Saudis want to do. And the other example, of course, is back in 2012 when there was a, a really complex incident whereby um, the Saudi ambassador to the United States, um, a, a chap named Adel Al Jaber was um, he was he was serving in Washington and there was an attempted assassination attempt on his life um, and and it was a very complex plot there there was if I get this straight sorry I've, I've not had a great deal of sleep recently but uh, forget this straight there was an Iranian secondhand car salesman in the United States whose cousin was in the Revolutionary Guard Corps back in Iran, who was tasked, the used car salesman was tasked to hire a Mexican drug cartel to put a hit out on Adel al Jaber, which was ultimately thwarted by the DEA that was watching this drug cartel. Now this, this all came out in 2012, uh, and you can find some of the details online, but again, quite a serious issue with an attempted assassination of a of a key Saudi diplomat and nothing happened. So it strikes me that there are some there are some factors at play here that are acknowledged maybe but that prevent or that seem to prevent a direct confrontation between the two states. Now of course the x factor in all of this is Donald Trump but that would be a different type of confrontation with Trump involved that wouldn't necessarily be direct. And that was, that was the question. I think there's a, a more likely chance of a US-Iran confrontation than a direct Saudi-Iran confrontation. 
Ja. Thanks. Um, and then I have another question here um, that asks uh, on the possibilities for realignment. Uh, isn't it easier for the UA UAE than the case A, given that MBZ has proved more pragmatic than MBS and that the UAE doesn't feel as threatened by Iran's religious legitimacy? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. But it's also about security. It's about fear. It's about geopolitics as i was as i was mentioning earlier and the justification for emirati engagement in yemen was as a consequence of fear that iran would get a foothold on the arabian peninsula and there was a, a sustained campaign of, of advertisements marketing um dramas that were were put on emirati tv that were trying to trying to stress this narrative and that shows that there was a very strong anti-iranian sentiment in the uae and that was that was shared by mbz and mbz and mbs were, were very close some would say that mbz had a, a key ideological influence on mbs um, I'm not sure that many Saudis would agree with that, but I think that was the, the narrative that was being put forward. And so I, I take the point that the other issue, though, is that Iran and the UAE, or sorry, in the UAE, there's a large number of, um, of Iranians. And there's a great level of trade between the UAE and Iran. And so there are, there are structural factors that would suggest that there's scope for improved relations. But the surprising thing was that given this, this pretty explicit hostility that MBZ had shown towards Iran, that he was willing to, um, to, to engage in this, this dialogue. Thank you, Simon. And then we have one, I think this is some, um, okay. Uh, so um, Farah asks, uh, what are the main differences in interior politics of Saudi Arabia before and after Qasem Soleimani? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so Farah asks, what are the main differences in interior politics of Saudi Arabia before and after Qasem Soleimani? So interior politics in Saudi... So I guess how have, how have domestic politics mm -hmm. changed in the presence or then respectively in the absence now of Qasem Soleimani, what impact did he have on domestic politics? If I, I interpret it, that right, Farah, I hope that that's that it's, correct. It's not so much about domestic politics per se, but I would say it's, it's more about strategic thinking. And there's this sense that, that Qasem Soleimani was, was the bogeyman. He was the person controlling everything, that he was behind all of the nefarious events that were, were taking place, behind all of the um, the subterfuge, all of the issues that were were playing out in the uh, in the in the Middle East more broadly, I guess that if there was an issue and and there was some type of Iranian activity um, that was was nefarious in some way, shape, or form, then Qasem Soleimani was was behind it. That there were these perceptions that he was the one responsible for for everything that was happening, and so I think that that losing Soleimani was, was obviously a big blow to the Iranians. But I, I don't know what impact it would have had on the, the domestic politics in Saudi. What I would suggest is that it had an impact on the way in which the Saudis engaged in strategic thinking, that mm -hmm. they, they saw the death of Soleimani as a positive for them because it immediately removed a figure who had um, who had all of this influence across the um, across the Middle East. He had 
a little black book of networks of contacts that he could use to 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 cultivate relationships to make a call to to engage in whatever actions he he deemed necessary and so removing that type of figure would obviously be a, a key win or a net net win for um for the saudis and those of you that haven't read the the piece in in foreign policy by stanley mccrystal i i urge you to do so it's it's fascinating as a as a piece of of, of literature written by an american general a key figure in the u.s military writing in such deferential terms about Qasem soleimani it's it's fascinating Thanks, Simon. So alluding to um, the last part of your, or connecting to the last part of your presentation, um, we have here a question that says, where does recent aid sent by the UAE and Kuwait to Iran fit within the regional rivalry? Is such development a novelty? Can it contribute towards easing tensions? That's the million dollar question, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's an interesting one because it also brings into, into scope Yemen. And one of the points of tension between the UAE and Saudi was over Yemen and strategy in Yemen, particularly with regard to the, the Southern Separatist Movement, the STC, the Southern Transitional Council. And I think that the Emirates were, were big backers of Idris al Zubaydi and his, um, his STC movement to the point where um, al Zubaydi is alleged to, to be a, um, a Man City fan walking around, um, around his, uh, his bases in Yemen in a Man City shirt. But um, that is much to the chagrin of, of Saudi Arabia, who who don't want to see a secessionist movement in Yemen. They want to see a united Yemen. And so that was a point of tension between the Emiratis and the Saudis. And it may be that, that it was just a, a superficial tension, that there was nothing substantive um, in this and that it was just maybe a, a veneer of public support from the Emirates to the STC. But it could also be something deeper and if it is something deeper, then you have actually quite a serious schism between uh, MBS and MBZ, between the Saudis and the Emiratis, not only over Yemen and the, the secessionist movement, but also over Iran. Because if this is more than just a, a one-off, then you could possibly have a realignment away from, um, away from Saudi Arabia, pushing it towards pariah status. And if that's the case, then then you could potentially have a new block forming. And that would create a, a multipolar gulf, which would be incredibly unstable and incredibly precarious with the Saudis and the Bahrainis and, and the Egyptians on one side, the, uh, the Emiratis on another, the Qataris and the Turks on another, the Iranians on another, the Omanis and the Kuwaitis somewhere in the middle of it all, trying to keep the peace amongst the GCC. And there you have a very complex, fluid set of alliances and relationships that, that are incredibly difficult to, to address in the longer term. And, and if we come back to, to, to aid as a, as a foreign policy tool, as a tool for diplomacy, right? Because um, I guess here what, what, what um, you know, the person here also wanted to to ask was like we could see here now that countries engage with uh, with Iran uh, by by sending aid and whether that that had been seen previously and I think I mean you yourself in your presentation have have spoken about this uh, in connection to um, the earthquake in 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 Bam in Iran right where KSA sent actually a mess of aid packages yes. Mm. But the question is, so because we have seen this periodically happening among the countries, I mean, it's a, a novelty, it is not, so to say, but how far does it, can it actually go in terms of really easing tensions? 
Well, I think it's it has to be combined with something else. And that something else has to be a, a, a political capacity. It has to have the capacity for um, a lasting or, or lasting short term, perhaps. It has to be, have the capacity for um, for broader engagement. And I say this with regard to the earthquake example, because there was a, a transitional moment on the way in Iran as um, as the move from Khomeini to Khamenei, the the tension between the office of president and supreme leader swung towards the president, power swung towards the president. And in that case, you have an opportunity for redrawing regional relations. But for that to happen, it's contingent on there being the right people in the right place at the right time with the right structural factors that allow agents to operate in a way that is conducive to um, to improving relations. And there's a lot of issues there. There's a lot of a lot of context specific contingencies that all have to fall in line because if they don't, then you just end up with the aid. For example, with the earthquake, if it had happened under under Khomeini or or ten years after the or X number of years after the invasion of Iran uh, of Iraq, then you could very easily have just had a donation of aid. But then without the political climate being right in Iran and the right people being in the right places at the right time with the right scope to engage in dialogue, then you could have just ended up with the donation. So what's going to be interesting is, is mm -hmm. if the aid given by the UAE to Iran is able to, to find additional traction and, and to see what will come of it. What I think is interesting though, is that there were, there were previously talks between the Emiratis and the Iranians over um, joint coast guard patrols or joint fishery patrolling or, or something relatively banal, but that were a front for something far more serious in terms of um, diplomatic discussions. So, I think there is potentially a climate there and conditions there that will allow for something more substantive to come out of it, but it's just the next step. And, and these types of diplomatic initiatives are obviously incredibly difficult to, to see through to the end and can be jeopardized, can be removed, can be ruined at any point in time if, if there are spoilers, if there are groups or actors who don't want this to happen. So there's a lot of contingencies uh, sorry there's a lot of factors that make it incredibly difficult for this to to hold if that sort of answers your question like i guess i guess the stars have to align all the dominoes have to be in the right place because otherwise they don't fall in the right way in the sun. um and then with with a, a smile uh, we have here james dorsey in disguise <laughs> Um, and he asks, um, what would it take to convince MBZ to allow for an opening to Qatar? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know, because again, there's long-standing structural issues that have created a legacy of distrust here. Um, and it's not just the distrust between the Saudis and the Qataris, but also between the Emiratis and there's tribal dimensions, there's national dimensions, there's broader competition in terms of sport, in terms of politics. It, it's going to take quite, um, quite something. So I'm, I'm going to throw an idea out there. And I'll just for the record say that this won't happen or I will be very, very surprised if it happens. But I think this would make the Emirates open up to Qatar, sharing the 2022 World Cup. That would, I think, thaw relations pretty quickly and would would um, yeah bring the, the Emiratis back into the fold. But as I say, I don't think it'll happen.
Well, let's see now with, with our world turned upside down <laughs> lately, I guess there's many possibilities for changes. Um, and I guess also Qatar might 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 not be um, uh, opposed to to having some um, some support and financial means, so to say. Mm. Um, so I think I just wanted to say um, also to if there is anybody um, who would like to ask a question but does not want to do this in English, you can also quickly write that in Spanish and I do my best to translate it to Simon if that was an option, just to to let you know. You can do that very, very, uh, very easily in the in the chat box here. No, perfect. Um, but I think we are also quite close to coming to an end to the closing time. Um, so I think it is actually it is time to to thank you, Simon, for being uh, with us, particularly in light of of everything that is going on uh, right now. What is what is happening uh, in your own life? And so I'm very very happy that you were able to join us. My pleasure. And, thank you um, for having me. Thank you for hosting, chairing, and thank you everyone. Yeah, we had a very very interesting lecture and. Uh, for, for those who missed it, of course, uh, it's possible to to watch it uh, then later on on YouTube. Or for those who would like to revisit it, it's it's going to be posted on the on the channel of the EMET. So thank you so much, Simon. Thank you.